What's up, Smite people? What? I thought we started at 11 today. Guys, get up. Seriously, no one's here yet? Where is everyone today, man? There's no one here. I mean, am I that early? Is there a... Trelly, there you f***ing are, you little fat piece of shit. Did you bring me my breakfast or what? I, I guess it's time for Masters. For eons, I have governed heaven and earth. Man or God, each is heard. Their anger, their pain, and in their time of need, I rise. Alona! Happy Sunday, Smite fans, and welcome back to another day of the Smite Masters event. It is day four of week number one, the last day of this current week, and finally our introduction of the SPL teams in towards this tournament to face off against the best of the SCC who have been battling out for the last three days to get up to this point. My name is Jim Mac Tucker. I've got Ro joining me on the Good desk morning. as we get ourselves set up for our very first set of the day. Still going to be following a lot of the similar format that we have been up until this point. So expect some big matchups. But now with these SPL talents coming in, the Valkyries and the Scares specifically today should make things a little bit more interesting amongst the scene. It will. We've kind of got the Valhalla Valkyries who had just graduated into the SPL. They were an SEC team for a long time. And now, you know, they've fought most of this team before as well. So it's kind of a, fam a familiar matchup. But it's, it's the, the, I guess, the undergrads versus the graduates in this matchup. Yeah, we're going to have the Elder Towns and the Valkyries. As you mentioned, you know, previously both having played with each other in the SEC just yep. six or so months yeah, ago. No. Now battling it out one more time, and if I'm not mistaken, we'll go a little bit more in depth into it later. That one actually ended up going the way of formerly known as Sleekness. Now most of the members of the Eldritch Hounds to kind of take that one out there. The Valkyries have been struggling a little bit in the SPL to find some victories. They were able to take their, their one and only set over the Leviathans, which is going to be a nice little boost for them coming towards this tournament, but have been struggling a little bit. But let's take a look at the brackets so you can see everything that's going to be happening today and all the matchups that will be going on. Eldritch Hounds and the Valkyries are first one. And the Catalan Wardens, with their win last night, they'll be moving on to face the Solar Scarabs. Both of these first matches, though, as per usual, best of ones. Yep. But, you know, anything can happen in a best of one as well. When it's an SPL team, you know, they've been watching these SEC teams for the last couple of days. They could kind of bring out their own strategies. They've been playing on this patch for, I want to say, three to four weeks now. Some of that on the private server before the patch was released to the public. So, again, you know, the SEC players were on that patch as well before we had the opportunity to play it. They've had a lot of chances to, to practice and develop new strategies as well. So, But Hounds have had to show their cards to get up to this point. You know, it's been a very, very competitive tournament so far for them. So, you know... We think, you know, they've obviously taken down the Valkyries before, but Valkyries since then have taken down the, the world champions, the Leviathans. So, you know, they're at a, a different level in that terms, of, like in terms of those results. So, you know, the Hounds here to prove themselves. Yeah, and in terms of between the SCC and the SPL, we almost always typically see some kind of difference when it comes towards their metas. Yes. SPL have a very different play style than that of the SCC in those SCC games and matchups. You can typically get away with a, a lot of kind of stranger stuff out there. You can make up some of these really weird picks, but when it comes to weird picks, the Valkyries are no strangers, especially when you have a player like Benny Q on their team and you kind of pa pair him up there with his jungler, Cure yes. Me. They're able to get away with quite a lot of things. Yeah, look, Benny Q 
relatively creative, I guess you could put it. You know, he, I think he's played uh, a Cthulhu mid lane as well before. I can't imagine something like that working anymore. A little bit, you know, clear is a little bit more required. But, you know, Hounds on the other side, they've got Oath, Remakami. I believe it was, you know, the last time they faced off, it was a different solo lane and a different mid laner. So now, you know, bringing in Remakami, bringing in Erupt Crimson, you know, I think these two solo laners, Remakami being, you know, very young compared to, you know, Aquarius, who has a little bit more tenured, and then Oath being, I guess, their star player, you know, we saw this game, I think he ended up 10 and 1. Yeah, something around there. Uh, quadra kill during this game on one of his signature picks. And, and that's kind of the dangerous part about Oath is uh, kind of unlike BenEQ in that instance, where BenEQ has these much more eclectic kind of picks, you know, the Anubises, the the Susano, Sun Wukong, Kabrakken mids that he'll kind of run a game on, you know, and expect him to pick it up. Oath has been known to play set time and time again. Yes. He's known to play gods like Al Kuang and, and things like this and just carry games and he's still doing it out here today. Yeah, I mean, he's a more traditional jungler, one that focuses, you know, very heavily on his mechanics and in a, in a meta like this where you see the warriors kind of go to the wayside of the assassins and things like that, then your mechanics really start to shine and you can really carry games for your team, you know. And this is what Oath's job has been so far this tournament, you know, carry his team through the early game, be the star player up until the point where their ADC has maybe five, four items if he's lucky and then the mage gets the damage online as well. So Oath is the one to watch for the early game. Yeah, if I'm if I'm the Valkyries team looking at the, you know looking at the Elder Chance team, I'm watching all of their games that have been happening up up until this point. And there's probably two gods specifically that I'm not letting this team have at all. One is going to be set. I don't yep. want Oath getting set again. I'm also probably not giving Crimson thought That's because what I was the, um, the, those two gods alone, you know, Crimson in our in our pregame interview yesterday said, "Man, I love Thoth. We love playing this early game. We do really good with it." And then they just got, like, two of their best gods in that game and then just kind of carried their way through game one. So if I'm the Valkyries going into this matchup, I'm looking at those two players specifically. You kind of maybe just let the dual lane do as the dual lane does and maybe put a little bit more focus on that mid 2v2. Yeah, and look, Valks are coming in fresh to this tournament. They've had the opportunity to watch and scrim throughout the time. So, you know, they can come in with their own strategies. Do they value the same gods as what these teams so far have been valuing? Are SPL on a different level and have they developed the meta to, to a whole different standard than, than what these SEC teams have? You know, we have Kirmi, who's, again, you know, a star player on that team who can definitely take it to Oath. And Kirmi still as well playing a very traditional style of jungler. Really did love things like the Erlong Shen, the Osiris's, the Gilgameshes of the days. Those were kind of the style of picks. Even the Shiva is one that the Valks were finding a lot of success with. Though we haven't seen really any of Gilgamesh this tournament. We also haven't seen any of Shiva this tournament. And the little bits of Erlong Shen that have popped up haven't seen too much success so far. So I think I'm really going to be interested to what Kirmi is going to be bringing out during this event. Yeah, look, all of these clips are from the Gilgamesh meta where he was just you know, one of the best gods in the game. So it's it's now Kirmi's opportunity to really flex his mechanical skills on these new assassin junglers that have come into the meta. I believe he can very much play, you know, things like this set and things like the Susano that we've seen other picks, uh, other other players pick up, you know, in the Mercury, the Nemesis and stuff like that. But, you know, so Kirmi's, I guess he was playing Gilgamesh, a lot of Shiva as well. Those things kind of fallen out of the meta. Yeah, for sure. I mean, we do see at least one little dodgy highlight, which is a god that's been seeing a little bit of priority as far yeah. as her picks and bans. Maybe not top of the top of the charts when it comes to that kind of a god out there, but Kirmi can still go over towards these more traditional assassin style of picks. We've been seeing success out of Hunbats as well, via the way yes, of Johnny yes. just pr prior. So e even that, the Kali, it's going to be interesting to say the least as to where Kirmi goes with his selections. Yeah, look, I like the Humbats. It's kind of both, you know, best of both worlds where he can have that big impact in team fights, which he's had on the Warriors like Shiva and Gilgamesh, but he also gets the assassin heavy mechanical playstyle that seems to be favored in this meta in terms of like the Boomba's Hammer scaling as well. Well, talking a little bit about the Valkyries here, we didn't talk a lot about Kirmin. We talked about BennyQ earlier on, and we've actually got BennyQ standing by for our pregame interview to talk to us a bit. First off, uh, finally great to have you here now that you got to sit, have some time to sit back and wait for the SEC teams to make it this far. What are some of your initial thoughts uh, on these teams that have made it up to this point? Um, I don't really know. <laughs> um, I'm pretty used to playing against the NA teams. I'm um, kind of sad we didn't get to play against any of the Europeans because playing new teams is always fun. But, yeah, no really big thoughts, I guess. Nothing really. So the last time that you guys faced off against at least the core of this team, that one didn't go so well for you guys. I believe it was a 3-2 the other way. You mm -hmm. think maybe that's going to change up here today, Benny? 
I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> it was funny. Actually, before you came out to the interview, I heard rumblings, you know, said that you wanted to come towards the interview, and they were saying, get Penny Q the Valkyries onesie that we got somewhere in the studio. And let me just <laughs> – I mean, I don't know if I could fit in that, but I'd be down to try. <laughs> I'll put it at this, Benny. I can barely fit in that thing. Oh. You would probably turn into a twosie. <laughs> All right. I mean <laughs> – I'm still down to try it, though. So, so what we're hearing is somebody go grab the ones you sell. Benny can give this one a try. But, uh, Benny, you're coming into this, into this full match. I mean, you know, it's your first day of the Masters. You know, you got to see a little bit of the meta. Do you expect things to change now that the SPL teams are starting to make their way into this event? Uh, yeah, I think got, um, like, what people think is good is, like, very drastically different, at least from our scrims. And um, I think maybe some of these games will be a little more fast compared to um, the games this week. Okay, so maybe a different meta, maybe things sped up a little bit. Well, Benny, thanks for coming by for the pregame interview. I'll let you get back with the team to get set up. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Look, he's kind of saying what I've heard from a couple other SPL teams as well. I won't name any names, but all of them have said that when I've spoken to them privately is their scrims are a lot faster than what these games so far have been. So it sounds like you know they're on either a different meta or an evolved meta. And I guess we're here to find that out today. Is the SPL meta better than the SEC meta? Traditionally, it has been. You know, this is a higher, higher, tier, of, higher tier of play. So, you know, I, I'm down for shorter games. Yeah, I think everybody might be uh, might be in for a few of those extra shorter games out here. And, and I think that also just speaks to the fact that it's not just the SPL to the SCC being different metas. It's also the NASCC versus the EU SCC being different right. metas. And it, it really has kind of been exaggerated with this 9.5 patch. The EU teams are playing towards these 45-minute banger games. E, uh, NA teams, especially a team like the Hounds, they're playing for those first 25 minutes and Maybe the SPL teams are even playing for those first 20 minutes at this point. Yeah, so something I'm you know, expecting to see in picks and bans here, if we're expecting faster games, then we probably need more objective DPS so we can look towards those you know, heavy objective DPS assassins like Mercury, uh, Nemesis, maybe even double hunter comps. And there's an objective DPS uh, god taken away already, uh, Bakasura. Yeah, shot at Oath immediately with that one. So the Valkyries are going to start targeting out this jungler to, to get their picks and bans rolling out. Remember, this is just a best of one. No elimination on the line for either of these teams yet. It'll just seed themselves for the remainder of our day. So anything that you can do to get yourselves potentially less games needed to be played is always going to be a good thing. And the Valkyries will continue to keep that ban pressure up on Oath. Set taken away. Opposite side, Yamoja and Jingwei. No surprise that those are the top two from the Hounds. Yeah, look, these bans... Oh, yeah, no surprise from Valkyries either, honestly. We were talking about the junglers for a reason, right? So those bands going towards Oath, who is their star player in the early game. And we're talking, you know, Benny said himself, you know, they played more early game focus. He didn't word it that way. But, you know, so if they take away some of Hound's strengths in the early game in those assassin picks, then they're going to have an easier time in the early game themselves. Valkyries with their final ban take away Baron Somni, who has been still widely regarded as one of the best gods to pick up if possible. So between him and the Jingwei, Maybe two of those top pick, top bands now off the board. The Hounds will take away Kleena as their last one. Again, no surprise on that. She has still remained a top assassin in that solo lane. Yeah, I would say those are probably the safest top three bands you can do. I think, you know, if you were just to talk broad meta, those gods are no matter what good in this meta because they're all just good gods right now. But again, there's the objective DPS we're talking about. If we need that early game, if we need that early game to be sped up, then we need that objective DPS on the Fire Giant and the Gold Fury, which Mercury certainly does bring. 80% win rate for the games that Mercury has been a part of. So four out of his five that he's made it into has become to a victory. And the Valkyries will take that as a first pick. Meanwhile, the Hounds on the opposite side. They'll grab Geb. And we've seen a little bit of Geb solo, but that was with Deathwalker. And not many players are Deathwalker. And not many players probably want to play Geb towards the solo lane. So most likely we'll probably see this god slanted back over towards the support role. And then Chernabog. A little bit of flexibility with this because we have seen him go mid and and hunter roll sometimes. Yeah, generally a safe pick. Well, both of these picks generally safe against Mercury. Geb having that anti crit built in and also being able to shield his carries or anybody on his team for that matter when Mercury really goes in for a big ultimate and those you know one punch one punch man style of play if he has that much crit. Valkyries with two more picks before they have to worry about their next wave of bans. They've got Kirmi selection locked in. And typically with the Valkyries, as for tradition with these guys, is they almost always reserve Benny Q's pick for last, or if they're in the first pick, that those last two slots there. So I think for me, as this season has gone through with the Valkyries, kind of one of the struggle points that they've had has been over towards that dual lane. And so getting something for Wowie, I imagine, is probably going to be the most important thing for the Valkyries on their mind. If that's the case for them, uh, Ro, is there any particular pick that you would think that they need to grab here? 
Well, whatever it is, I'm sure it's going to be identifying, right? If they're picking something that's late game and scaling, like this get this Geb and Chernobog, then we may see a slower game again. But I can imagine yeah, they're going to pick something that's a little faster. Artemis, not necessarily faster, but can take the fight at any point against Chernobog and Geb. That lane clear on their side, not fighting? too aggressive. So I think Artemis, a, a generally safe pick. But Bologna, definitely somebody that can run the game. Yeah, Bologna, only seen one game so far out of this weekend. It saw was. it yesterday. That was blue. This with Deathwalker and it was an um, interesting build. Yeah, yeah. I think interesting might be the best way to put that build. Uh, not not too many times are we seeing a, a Devourer's Gauntlet Bologna uh, out of all things, but not, maybe not so surprising for the Eldritch Hounds. Thoth can be locked in. That one's for sure going over to Crimson. Yeah, this is something Valkyries would most likely have expected. They might have expected it in the top two, but um, Crimson, you know, brave enough to let it drop to, to the third position. So not a surprising pick here. So something that I can imagine Valks were prepared for. Now we jump into the second wave of bands. Hounds will have their first option after that round of bands goes through. And they're going to take a couple of shots over at Gamma specifically here, taking away the Athena. The Valkyries recognizing the Hounds do not have their jungler yet will take a couple of shots that way, at least starting out with this Kali. And that's definitely a god that if we're thinking these are games are going to go 30 plus minutes, Kali one of those chainsaw late game hyper carries. Yeah, look, Hounds as well making their bands really impactful in the early game. They don't want to play against those, uh, you know, unexpected Athena ults and, and Ymir's very strong early game as well. Even though Geb has a great cleanse towards both of that stun and that taunt, you just still don't want to deal with the early game pressure that they provide. And if you're putting early game pressure on top of what Valkyries already have in their team comp with a Bologna and a Mercury ulting down your lane, then, you know, you can start to get real, you start to struggle to, to push your Thoth and your Chernobog into the late game like they want. Dodgy going to be banned away by the Valkyries, along with that Ymir as you were talking about. And that now brings up Kabraken. So uh, looking at the Eldritch Hounds roster, you've got, the, you've got your Geb, you've got your Kabraken. One for support, for sure. You're, you're not going to yep. throw Geb anywhere other than probably one of those spots, unless this Kabraken is going to be going to, like, solo lane and they're still holding their jungler. But if you're the Hounds, or maybe if you're the coach of the Hounds here and, you, and you've locked in, Geb Kabraken for this team. I mean, where are you slotting this Kabraken at? Look, it's flexible as well as the Geb, a little flexible as well. We've seen Deathwalker run it in solo. I don't think we'll see Ramakami run, run Geb in solo, but he could run the Kabraken in solo. It's not a terrible matchup against Bologna. It's kind of, you know, it's kind of even, but the Kabraken definitely a great matchup into the Mercury and the Artemis. Kabraken, when his one is active, can run directly through those traps. So he's only really afraid of the boar at that point. And the amount of times I've seen Kabraken walls completely nullify Mercury ults is, you know, I, I can't keep count. Fafnir and Merlin, the final two picks for the Valkyries. And then with the Susano locked in, that one should slot the Kabraken now towards that solo lane, Susano in the jungle. But let's go back about this Fafnir because we've only seen him, what, once, maybe twice so far this tournament. Got picked up by the Tanukis in their game three matchup. And I'm maybe a little surprised that Fafnir isn't as strong as he is or maybe isn't as picked as much just because of the fact that we are in this very auto attack style meta, this double hunter, and then even these auto warriors. Yeah, so this is what Benny might be talking about in terms of games being a faster pace. Fafnir is someone that can always get in there, but does scale well into the objectives, right? Around that 23 minute mark, he can blow up an objective pretty quickly, giving that auto attack speed to Mercury or Artemis, right? So look, Merlin, Great objective DPS, Mercury with the crit, Artemis most likely with the crit, and Bloner with some of the best zoning in the game as well. So they can certainly threaten these objectives, and they all have, well, I would say winning lanes, if not like even lanes. They don't seem to be struggling in any of their lanes right now, so I imagine they'll be taking the fight to the Hounds in the early game. If you're the Elder Towns, you know, looking at this squad, knowing that objective's going to be the name of the game, you want to get your best foot forward, you maybe want to try and slow down that momentum. So if you're the Hounds, especially if you're Oath right here, where do you try and put some of your pressure? Where do you put that priority to slow down the Valkyries? All right, look, if he can shut down this Bologna, so this Bologna won't get to a point where she can just rotate and zone um, the, the Hounds out from getting to these objectives, especially if Bologna's got so much pressure that she's 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 pushing the, assume, I'm assuming Kabraken solo under the under the tower and then is able to rotate to the Gold Fury, build a gold lead, and then all of a sudden Fire Giant becomes threatened for them as well. So I think I'd like to see Susanna could maybe shut down this Bologna, otherwise focus a little bit on, on the Artemis, keep her scared so she's sitting under her tower and that gives Chernobog more space to ult and rotate uh, and then Merlin always a, a target that you can try to dive just make sure not to get hit by those Fafner hammers in the mid lane and then you should be fine so with these SPL teams you know from with the rumblings that's been going on they definitely think that these games are going to go a lot faster the Hounds seem to have kind of dragged themselves maybe a little bit more towards that late game so if this does start slanting towards that latter half of the game 
do the Valkyries have a composition row that, where they'd be able to fight up against the Hounds? They certainly do. As we've seen other teams kind of balance it out, you know, bring the early game in, but also have a really strong late game. I think their strengths in the late game aren't necessarily in the team fight, although Artemis are generally one of the best team, is one of the best team fighting gods. Mercury, not so much, but their objective DPS really bolsters their late game because Hounds cannot sleep on an objective. If they don't have vision of it, of it for five seconds, it could disappear. Valkyries and the Hounds in this best of one matchup. Again, nobody goes home from this. It's just a set up for the remainder of our day. Puts themselves one set closer to qualifying to the next week of Smite Masters because two losses here today. This means it's going to be end of the line for your tournament life in Smite Masters. It means you're going to have to wait a little bit longer and have to work maybe a little bit harder if you lose out on this one. Ro, looking at these two compositions, do you have one that comes out as more of like a clear favorite for you in this game? Look, if they end up putting the Geb towards the solo lane, I would give the clear favorite to Valkyries. If they put the Kabraken in the solo lane, I'll even it out a bit because I think Kabraken can take it to Bologna a little bit, and Kabraken will also scale into that Boomba's Hammer, depending on the build, if they do go for it. But I think if they put that Geb in that solo lane, they're going to have a real struggle in the early game because Bologna will be able to rotate and control the game and, and force these objectives. So if they, you know, it, it's up to them, whatever guards they're more comfortable on, whatever lanes they're more comfortable with, I just think it would be easier with Kabraken solo. It would make Oath's job easier as well. He wouldn't have to babysit that Geb. Maybe a very exaggerated, uh, uh, maybe really emphasize how dangerous the objective play is. You know, talk about the Fafnir with Mercury Artemis alone, then you throw a Bologna, maybe an Eagle's Rally, gives him some of that extra burn there. Plus how good Frenzy is. We've seen Bracer pop its way in a couple of times. If I'm the Hounds, I'm definitely keeping every single ward around those objective pits. Yeah, I mean, look, one thing in their corner as well, they have the Chernobog, so they can fly up in the air and get vision of those objectives or get vision of where the players are if they're around those objectives. Not only that, but they have the Thoth ultimate. That's a high steal potential. You know, get Blink ult to, you know, stop any DPS from the Valkyries, followed by a Thoth ultimate, you could see a steal. Yeah, that could be an easy steal, actually, thinking about that. You know, uh, it's one of those things where we, we've gone through so many metas, Ro, where teams don't care about the necessarily the actual objective secure. It's just... Who can kill the objective the fastest? Who can get right. that burn here? But also at the same time, even with some of these more objective secure style of gods, things like Poseidon and, and Thoth, we have still seen people get out secured on those fire jets yeah, look, and those we golds. Can, we can see Mercury and Artemis crits up to 600, 800 at times. So, you know, a Thoth ultimate, maybe, you know, push him 1,000. But, you know, they have the tools to stop that DPS from coming out. Kabraken walls can stop those auto attacks and stun Mercury out. A Geb shield can stun Mercury as well, or you know, whatever DPS they have hitting the fire giant. And Merlin's secure, not that great. He has a lot of burn, a lot of DPS, but no secure that can match with Thoth. I mean, what was it yesterday? Like a like a, a dash from Mercury that stole a fire giant or something like that? At that That's point. right. Yeah. You never know what's going to happen in these games, especially when teams are taking these 50-50 coin tosses uh, up against these objectives, especially when you kind of get into the heat of the moment, you know, in these panics. You're trying to burn down these enhanced fire giants after you've been playing for six, seven hours, you know, throughout the day. Sometimes it can't take a toll on the mental, but this is game one of the day, so these guys should all be fresh and ready to go. Yeah, I imagine so. Look... I think their comps are pre pretty clearly identified, um, you know, so there's a, there's a, there is a pause in game, so they have time to think about it as well. I think Hounds, you know, they, they can very clearly see that they're up against some, a good objective DPS, so they just need to make sure, one, Valkyries aren't pulling those objectives, and if they do start pulling the, the objectives, we need to be ready to react, because if they do start to snowball, they're going to have a really hard time scaling. Granted, you know, I think the team comps late game is still relatively even, so I, overall, I think I'd give it to the Valks, and unless... Hounds put Kabraken in the solo lane. I think they're struggling a lot in the early game as well. Yeah, it's going to be potentially a long game, potentially a short game. We don't know. With what Benny Q is teasing and with what some of the other SPL pros and, and players are out there saying, this could be a fast one, maybe just depending on how all of that one pans out. But if history is any indication, at least up until today, just from the knowledge that we do immediately have, from the, the actual tangible knowledge that we've seen from, from all of these games up until this point, we could be still sitting at at least a 30, 35 minute game between these two teams. The history between these guys, you know, both playing in the SCC, not even, you know, a half a year ago. That's right. Where the former, you know, the Sleekness roster and the Hounds, the core three of them between Oath, uh, Oath, Quig, and Dude Man Bro, were able to find a cheeky win over the, the Valkyries. And that was back when, when the Valks were the winner dogs. They were also the number one seed at that time. Sleekness was that number four. So it made it a little bit interesting as far as that's concerned. Maybe we see another one that does it. We've been seeing a lot of these upsets, actually. On our first two days, the number four seed upset the number one. Yeah, we yeah we have. Look, and Benny in the interview didn't seem too concerned by it, honestly. You know, he's they're, they're at the point where they've been ele elevated past that point, and then they've beaten the Valkyries, so I don't think they're too concerned. 
But we do have a little bit of a pause coming through here, so we are going to take a very quick break. When we come back, we'll get you guys set up for game one. Welcome back. Sorry for the delays. We are trying to get these players right into game, get you guys set up, and get these guys ready to go. That way we can get game number one of our day underway. It's going to be a very important one for both these teams, maybe at least as far as the mental is concerned. Like I said previously, the, the formerly known as Sleekness roster of the Hounds did find a win against the Valkyries. Now, again, this was months and months ago. The, win, the former winner dogs, now Valk's team, has had plenty of time to readjust themselves. They've had some time in the SBL to practice, and we'll see if that can pay off for them here in game number one, Valhalla Valkyries versus the Eldritch Hounds. Who's going to take it? Let's find out. It's going to be all down to the SCC team to prove their worth. They've already made it this far and beaten out all the other six teams that weren't able to make it to this point. Trelly, the Valhalla Valkyries, what are we thinking they're going to be pulling out up against the CC? I'm so excited to see just a warrior in the solo lane with that's toll. I, I mean, Aqua is one of my favorite soul laners to watch because he's not going to sit back and farm up for late game. He wants to get active and he wants to brawl. So you're not going to be able to wait till late game and start those Bumba's hammers built. And it looks like Remakami recognizes that, goes for the Vamp Shroud. This is not the SCC style meta we have been seeing this week. This is this is the real deal. You're up against an SPL team, so you got to bring some more pressure. And I think it's smart for the Hounds to recognize that. Oath, though, is going for this Bumba's Dagger, looking for that Bumba's Hammer later on in the game. Uh, no doubt in my mind, this is a, a, an item that's just truly absurdly good on Susano. Yeah, both of the upgrades are actually really strong on Susano, depending on which one you want to go. You want your cooldown resets or just the extra damage on your auto attacks and the Bumba's Spear. But on the flip side, Kirami just going for Eye of the Jungle. Both very strong in their own right. Usually it's just you don't want to overcap cooldown that much. And because Oath has that Spear, probably going to start the Transcend. It's not really worried about a Jotun's Wrath. You just you have too much at that point. 
Yeah, for sure. Doesn't necessarily need all the early game cooldown if he's going to be able to push that towards that late game, which is where Susano is going to uh, be finding more of his prevalence anyway. Uh, Trelly, on this left-hand side, this is a, a lane we've kind of been seeing bits and pieces of, right? We've seen the Chano, we've seen the Artemis, the Geb, and the uh, the Fafnir before. Never in this formation. How are you expecting this uh, left lane to play out? I imagine while we probably not looking to get too aggressive until level five, maybe a good hammer by Gamma into a trap could set up something, but this is an Artemis. You don't really want to fight early on. Trenobok doesn't either, if we're yeah. honest. The 1v1 here is not going to be so great. Usually you drop the Caledonian Boar, you drop Tusky, and then Dude Man Bro is just going to go up into his ult, immune that, and then dash away if need be. The the 1v1 potential is not so much. What you want to look out for is when Kirmi hits level 5. We see a Sonic Boom being charged up from behind the Tier 1 tower, and that's when I think they'll be looking to get a little bit more aggressive in that lane specifically, but not too much action just yet in this game. Kirmi in the mid lane has fallen down to about half, but this is a level 2 in 9.5. Those of you not in the know, 40% extra HP. Benny Q could be caught out here. Dashing forward is Crimson. Any other patch, I think Benny falls down there, nearly does anyway. Or up Crimson and Oath getting super aggressive early on. Can I just say a pet peeve of mine? Uh, I don't like Blink on Mercury. I don't think it's necessary. And I also think Kirmi will be able to find some use for it, obviously. If you are going to start the Blink, it tells me you're looking to get aggressive. Benny Q does use the Flicker, now Oath gets a no free kill. No way! That's the jet stream in! Oath does take two tower shots, but what a way to start this game. Yeah, I mean, Rough Crimson is not missing right now. All of these Hieroglyphic Assaults making sure the Benny Q can't sit here in lane. Merlin, one of the premier late game hard carries in the mid lane, but right now does not clear the wave quickly. You can't even poke out people because you have to use your clear on the wave. You can try to hit both, but if you are focusing on damage specifically, you're not going to be killing those minions. Whereas Crim can just hit the wave and you from halfway across the lane. So it's going to be very difficult to survive. Benny Q falls down for first blood and Oath gets credit for the kill. Quig could be in a bit of bother. Does force the Frenzy Pop from the Valhalla Valkyries, but he is still just looking around this bubble buff looking to be a general nuisance. He's going to look to steal it, but there's almost no way. Just going to roll back to lane. Yeah, I mean, that's sort of what these supports have been doing as of lately. Just letting your ADC soul the purple buff, and then you just stand there menacingly. Even if you don't get the steal, what you do do is give pressure, where Doom Ambrose level 4 up. Huge wave here and push Wowie under tower. Now you're denying gold. It's going to work out either way, even if you don't get that buff. Unless, of course, a nice hammer into the into the girl pop and then a trap maybe quick will fall down there but not going to be too much of an issue i'm expecting to see oath get a little bit active on this duo side because of that first blood maybe after the transcendence gets finished but you see him take over to level five typhoon is available and that's going to make for some pretty easy ganks unless some ultimates come through he is going to take a look over towards the red buff potentially looking to uh Put some pressure onto Benny Q once again. Has already fallen down for first blood. And look at this positioning from Oath. He could have maybe have uh, incited a little bit of danger from Kimmy, but this Mercury really not known for its early game damage here at four minutes into the game. Yeah, I would say if this was last patch, maybe Oath tries to dive that tower there with a final judgment from Rub Crimson, but towers are sh shredding mm. right now. So you really don't want to push your luck. You don't want to try to go for a level five tower dive when you already have first blood. You already have that advantage. Of course, Benny Q's beads are up in about 20 seconds, and I think that was the timer in their head. Like, maybe we can go for something. I'll knock him up with a Typhoon. You get the easy snipe, but... We also don't want Oath to die, so they're going to call that gank off pretty much immediately. If you take a look at the relics here, actually, let's take a look at Kirmi real quick. Charging up the ultimate, he's looking for that sonic boom, is going to thread the needle and hit between these two players. Quig does not get hit by the ultimate, he is taking a lot of damage though, that's going to be the scoop. Down falls the support, but it could definitely have been worse. Dude Man Bro could have been the target there. Yeah, if Quig hits five, I think probably able to get out there because again, Kirmi does have blink, not the beads. The CC could have been enough to get out, but well played by Kirmi just to make sure to grab out the roll the rollout so that no sort of escape. Answers back. Now both junglers are going to be sitting with a kill. We've seen this Golden Blade start very prevalent in this tournament thus far, trying to get the camps online as fast as possible. Oath not going to be going that route. Once the Transcendence online, since that first Blood Gold came through, already stacking it while Kirmi only has that Golden Blade. It's already a big damage swing in favor of Oath, and he's going to be getting more and more powerful as that Transcendence stacks up. 
But so far, so good for the Eldritch Hounds. They've been able to establish themselves first blood. They've got about 400 gold in their coffers at the moment, which at five, you know, five minutes isn't the fastest lead that you could have hoped for, but it's definitely not nothing. Yeah, I have to imagine it's just that first blood bounty sitting on Oath and then a little bit of neutral farm here and there because it looks like Aquarius has himself a, a little bit of a lead in that soul lane, just XP-wise, been able to push out Ramakali, push some waves under tower and steal away those harpies whenever possible. And that's what you expect to see from a Bologna right now. Obviously, Kabrakin has some decent clear, but you don't want to sit there in the tremors when there's a Bologna with Shogun's Kusari just attacking you non-stop with the bludgeon strike. So you don't want to sit in lane too much, and I do expect to see, because of the teleport that Aqua has, Remakami has B. It's a little bit more afraid of the gang, where Aqua's like, I'm going to rotate in. I can poke you out effectively. I can get a second health bar if I need to. And then once I upgrade this teleport, I'm simply going to beat you to the fights on the other side of the map. Absolutely, yeah. And it's just part of the uh, the power of this Bologna as well, this big team fight presence that she can have with that Eagles Rally, with the disarms as well. Really look towards Dude Man Bro in these encounters when Aquarius is going to be showing up into them, because he's just probably not going to be allowed to auto for a solid couple seconds. Yeah, Bologna's a great pick into the Turner Bog because Turner doesn't have that much ability damage. Remakami pre beat the snack grab and yes. will be just fine. What you don't want to watch out for me, and what you do want to watch out for is the fact that the beads are down. I don't think they were looking for a kill there. I think they're looking for a kill now. Now that those bees are down, expect to see Kirmi come back around, but looking to get aggressive in the mid lane. And EQ takes a lot of damage. There's the Typhoon, and Oath with the dash through to get the kill. The shield is going to come through from Quig, and there's going to be the Sonic Boom. Kimmy looking to find some more damage. Major look, major fall. And it looks like the bees was down from Oath, just got stunned underneath the tower. Beautiful ult by Kirmi to clean that one up. I thought that he might have given up a little too early, but he doesn't miss those major looks, and it looks like Aquarius was about to rotate in behind, but decided to steal away the farm instead. That's the best thing to do, I think, when the jungler will fall. Take away as much farm as possible. I don't think there's any way that Quig falls here, so just going to back off as Rimakami tries to fight for his own blue buff. Has been able to pressure Aquarius off of it for now. Quig rotating in. This is a position we like to see Quig uh, uh, play a fair amount. He comes over and helps Remakami with that blue buff when he is getting behind. And I like that presence of mind from the support here. Yeah, you don't really have to sit in duo lane because Dude Man Bro is so safe on the turner bog. You can just dash into the wall whenever you get scared. You can ult over if you need to. Say, so, hey guys, I'm going to join the fight. I'm coming over to Aquarius. So Dude Man Bro is going to be very mobile on this pick. We already touched on the fact that Aquarius has that teleport, but Dude Man can essentially go anywhere he wants as long as an enemy is there. So you have to watch out for, you know, maybe baiting out Aqua's ult early. He flies over. It'll give Wowie a little bit of extra pressure in lane, but I guess that's the trade-off, right? For sure. And, you know, Dude Man Bro, as you mentioned, can go anywhere Aquarius goes. If Aquarius wants to teleport into a fight, hey, guess what? There's an enemy there now. And that is something that Dude Man Bro can anchor to. But for now, Oath once again looking to get aggressive on to Benny Q. Blink forward. That's going to be the beads from the mid laner. And the damage isn't quite good enough. Enough. Crimson is here though, and Dude Man Bro is making that rotation over the ultimate expended. There's the final judgment to claim the life of Benny Q, and he is not having a fun game. I had my eyes glued on the Typhoon cooldown. Oh, it's a little blue diamond on the right side just lit up, and then Crim's like, I got it. Just Don't worry about him it. With the final judgment. So beautiful play from Crim thus far. Has so much damage off in this mid lane, and no fault to Benny Q. I truthfully don't think Merlin's great right now in this meta because it takes too long mm. for you to be able to full clear. Krim can say, you're not stepping up to this wave. I will keep you at your tower line, and there's nothing you can do about it. Wowie, though, has the trebuchet on his side, which means Dude Man Bro has to try and defend this. No one is rotating over right now. It looks like Oath just recognized that might be pushing in. Wowie's just going to steal away some farm and use that to say, dude, you're going to sit right about there at the tower line. I'm going to steal some farm in the meantime. And this is uh, luckily not going to be able to do any damage to that tier 1 tower. Because it's going to be just fine. There's a really short ultimate there from the Mercury. And it's going to catch Oath off guard. Benny Q flickering in, trying to do some damage onto Crimson. Gamma goes up into the Draconic form. That was a lot expended by the Valhalla Valkyries. Kimmy, though, nearly picks up the kill onto Oak. Yeah, I was going to say, if Gamma doesn't untransform right now, they better be going for Gold Fury or they're just wasting that cooldown. So he will untransform, get it back on cooldown as quickly as possible. And there's no real way they could have went for the pull there. They got a fair bit of poke, but there's still some key ultimates available. Quig has Cataclysm, which pretty much stops all DPS, as Ro touched on the desk. And Final Judgment back up as well. So it looks like no more aggression at the moment. We're seeing some posturing towards that left side of the map. And the reason is this Gold Fury is certainly attainable. If you're looking at these builds, I would imagine right when Dude Man Bro finishes that Wind Demon, which he 
did just now. They're going to get a big spike of DPS. Obviously, Kirmi has the stone cutting sword as well, so they have a fair bit of damage if they do want to try and pull this. They just have to find some sort of avenue to gain an advantage, a pick, maybe an ultimate. Just just someone's beads down could be enough to pull the trigger. The Pyromancer as well currently being looked at as one of the uh, first objectives to be done in these games. I'm pretty sure uh, it has been the first objective done in most of these games so far this week. So potentially looking at the right-hand side, which is what the Eldritch Hounds seem to be doing. The Aquarius is the target. Three people here looking to find some damage, but so far there isn't a lot coming out. I scratched that as Aquarius takes just two giant knockups. Crimson coming through to clean up that one. But Kimmy and Gamma are here. No rotation from Benny Q just yet. This could be the opening that the Hounds wanted to go for an objective, but I'm not so sure. You hate to see this if you're a Valhalla Valks fan because they essentially rotated late. And what I always say to my teammates in rank is if you're going to rotate late, don't rotate at all. Find something else on the map. They all came over here to say, hey, we're going to help Aquarius. Aquarius dies anyways, and there's no gold for being looked at. Pyromancer will be the answer back. Quig is the only one here. A Shockwave is the best option to counter. He says, you know what, it's just a Pyromancer. I'm going to back off. Absolutely the correct call that Gab. While he, uh, I don't think he's in too much danger directly, there's enough CC there between the two of them, Gamma and Kimi, that is, that he has a reasonable reason to be scared. Um, but looking back at that gold lead, Trelly, this uh, 400 gold that was once sitting in El Town's pockets in the lead, is now the other direction. This is 12 minutes into the game though, so dead even. Yeah, it's just gonna be that Pyromancer. That was a great call by the Valk to recognize it. Hey, the Hounds used a lot to make sure that Aqua goes down there, so let's just try to push our lead as best as we can. Answering back with the first neutral objective as the game. As you mentioned, in the games we have been watching, Gold Fury doesn't go down for quite some time. Pyromancer mm -hmm. sometimes goes down twice before we even see a Gold Fury pull, and that's just because it's an easier objective to pull and it's not going to be the end of the world if you lose it. Of course, Gold Fury is a little bit bigger of a spike. You don't want to be giving that one up for free, especially if you have worked so hard to pull it, then it just gets one tap. So we're seeing more stock in that right side of the map. Now, Kirmi is heading over here just to get some Oracles once the vision, but I think Quig and Oath know this timer, and they're going to be here as well. And some interesting uh, build direction for Kirmi, who is going to get pressured away from the Oracles. Gamma trying to over the ball, but not quite going to be successful. Typically, uh, typically, Charlie, we see the, the Mercury head in for that early rage, trying to get those crit stacks online. This time around, though, Kimmy opting for the double katana into the wind deep. Yeah, I love this build because you're usually your ADC is probably going to get crit too. This isn't a meta where you're not going to be building crit as an ADC as Wowie is not currently probably going into that silver branch. Maybe goes into the upgraded ornate arrow and a wind demon. That's usually all the crit you really need right now if you want to go for that chin size build. Hear me though, it's looking for an ult here. Quig is aware of this and is hiding as well. It looks like they might just try a 2v2 and Gamma's rotating over. Kami's potentially looking for it, but the hounds are really close to that tower line. I think the call from Wowie is that it's not worth it, not just yet. So he's going to uncap the trigger on that one and make his way back over into the jungle to find some more avenues of farming. The Eldritch Hounds, however, moving here into the left-hand side. Trelly, the next point of interest has got to be Crimson in effort of that Gold Fury. Benny Q, though, taking so much damage, flying over his dude man, bro. He's going to find the Aegis, but that's going to be Tusky. Dashing into the wall is the ADC, who already picks up one kill straight out into the trap. What a beautiful placement there from the ADC. Kami, though, is going to fall down in trade. Oath makes his way out of this one, and that should be a two for one. It is a two for one there. Doom Embro is down to use a fair bit of DPS if you did want to go for that Gold Fury. So now the Elder Towns have to back off. A big win for them, of course. Finding Kirmi and Benny Q going 0 in 4 is going to be a solid shutdown because Kirmi was really the, the win behind the Valhalla Valkyrie sails thus far. Whenever he comes in, he's able to find a return kill, something like that. 2 0 at the time, not going to be the case anymore. And Oath getting credit for the kill. It's going to help out as well. 3 and 1 on this Susano. Been playing very well so far. I don't know if you noticed, back when Kirmi was going for that gank, there was a ward between the towers. So I believe Quig was saying, hey, Doom Embro, we know that there's going to be some sonic booms coming the whole way down the lane. I'm going to give you some vision there. So Kirmi really can't look towards that dual lane. The ward has petered out now. But at this point, Doom Embro is able to try and trade those autos. Kirmi wasn't able to finish Wind Demon on that back. Didn't really get any gold during that fight. And Doom Embro is critting decently hard right now when it does come through. Yeah, for, for sure, that Wind Demon is on the board now for Dude Man Pro. So as you mentioned, 
Gonna be doing a little bit of extra damage on those lucky strikes. Meanwhile, Oath building into the uh, the Transcendence, the Hydra's Lament after that. Susano, really well known as one of the premier auto attack cancel based junglers here uh, in the game of Smite. And then following that up with what could be a Crusher, what could be a Jotun's Wrath. There's no way that's a Jotun. There's too much cooldown. Certainly, right? I mean, maybe. Maybe he's just going for, like, a max cooldown build. It's a decent stat stick as well, but it could also very much be that uh, Brawler's Beat Stick. There's a little bit of healing coming out from the Valhalla Valkyries. Aquarius has the heal from the three. Gamma has the heal from his uh, second ability. Betty Q and Wowie will be both building lifesteal, so it makes sense. Yeah, I think the Brawlers and or the Crusher are both going to be solid options here. It looks like the Valks, again, they do have this Fafnir, so despite being a little bit down in the fight category, they can burn this very quickly and they're going to go for it. Up into the Draconic form, there's the Frenzy Pop. No way Quig can do anything about that, and this is what Ro was talking about on the desk earlier on. If the Eldritch Hounds lose track of an objective for so much as five seconds, that objective could just disappear. Yeah, and Aquarius did make the rotation over the Teleport was expended, just helping out the squad just in case anyone was going to show up. Now, we're looking at that gold lead, despite it being 6-3 in favor of the Eldritch Hounds, Valhalla Valks have climbed up to about a 2k gold lead. Just better macro farm all around the map, getting more camps, invading more camps, and the objectives going their way more often than not. The fights, though, are in favor of the Eldritch Hounds for now. So far, we haven't seen a full 5v5, but the skirmishes that we've seen taken have certainly favored the boys on the red side of the screen here. Looking to start up this Pyromancer over the wall. Benny Q putting down some damage. There's the Sonic Boom. There's finally one. The Eldritch Hounds are going to be able to secure out the objective for now. And the chase is on. Quig gets stunned out. Now looking like Remakami trying to peel for his support. That's going to be the wall to trap three people in. Quig should be able to make his way out. And the Valhalla Valkyries are going to call it quits there. This is all going in favor of the Hounds. They get the objective. They're able to get out. Dude Man Bro is split pushing right now. Wow, he made the rotation over. He's like, guys, do you, do you need help? Are they going for fire? He's here. But now Dude Man Bro gets free farm. I think the Valks are smart to answer back Whoa. with the trebuchet looking at that tier 1 tower as well. But it looks like Kirmi's going to take the 1v1 for his Doom Man, bro. He's going to go up into the sky, landing back over towards Gamma. Maybe not the best decision. Going to get hit by the hammer. Instantly forced to use the beast, but on the upside, he is out and alive. Yeah, I mean, at that point, just going to the nearest person to your basing. Guys, I, I, I tried to invade the purple buff, and I got really scared. I need help, man. Uses the beads, but a small price to play for your price to pay for your life. So gonna have to play a little bit safer now. But do remember, I will be able to just take the long trek back to base. Interested to see if Kirmi does throw some stock into that left lane now that the relic is down. Has been power farming pretty effectively. A level down to Oath, but if you're looking at the solo, and Aquarius has been ahead as well, despite falling once with that big gank we saw in that right lane. Aquarius has been able to just auto attack everything with this build: the Shoguns, the Berserker Shield, and the Frostbound Hammer. Essentially means the auto attackers on the side of the Elder Towns are not going to want to fight Aqua right now. Uh, no, absolutely. We're at any point in the game for, for that matter. Aqua just so far really, really solid uh, in his capabilities to take these engagements with the ADCs and auto attack based characters. Now, Trilly, we, we're seeing this build starting to get uh, jumped up. Actually, hold on, Dude Man Bro. Sonic Boom from halfway across the universe is going to get a nice cheeky shield there from Quig to stop him from getting CC'd out. Now he's on the offensive, potentially looking for some more aggression here. But here comes the rotation from Gamma up in the jungle. He is going to be caught between a couple different members here. Does have two jumps available to him and the ultimate, so he should just be fine. Gets rooted out over the wall. Oath still looking to continue out some of this aggression. Yeah, we saw Kirmi recognize the Doom Ambrose beats are down. It looks like a Cataclysm after the ult could be Gamma's down, and he definitely is. Beautiful ult by all the members of the Hounds here able to answer that one back. Aqua, nowhere in sight, so there's no way anyone else is going to want to fight here. You don't have a front line. I was going to say, if Bologna's on the way, maybe they look to chase this one down. But you're just going to say, goodbye, Fafnir. We need to reset because Primal Fury is going to be spawning up shortly in about a minute and a half, give or take. We don't want to risk anyone else dying before that. And again, Kirmi recognized the Doom Embryo had no beats, but ended up taking more damage than he could even dish out because you don't want to ult underneath the tower. That was a, a long ult and also probably didn't expect the, the shield from Quig. Quig was hiding in that purple buff, mm. able to shield that one. So it does get the Aegis, so that's going to be a nice relic down. Doom Embryo, not going to be too worried in the lane for at least a little bit longer. Yeah, no, he's perfectly fine and happy. Has the ultimate back available to him now, so even if another gank of some description comes out through onto him, he should be able to find his way out. Meanwhile, Aquarius on the right-hand side, Oath 
potentially looking to hover over here, but he's just going to clear that camp and head back out. So this is just going to be the, the classic, typical solo lane slap fest. Yeah, it looks like Kirby might be looking for something here. Steps over the ward, so Ramakami will probably hide behind the tower as we saw him just <laughs> reposition. Like, wait, I don't want to get ulted. I'm going to hide here. Smart play, and now Ramakami will see. Nope, I was going to say, might see Kirby leave on that same ward, but still sticking around. Oath and Quig are going to posture on this right side of the map. They all know that Mercury is here and Sonic Boom is available. We want to help out just in case our Kabrakan gets dove. We're seeing the Valks posture up for this Greater Scorpion slash mid camps. I don't imagine we're going to see too much aggression unless Pyromancer spawns in. And I'm really surprised we haven't seen the Eldritch Hounds continue to put their aggression through onto Benny Q here. We saw so much pressure put onto this mid laner throughout the first couple minutes of the game. Setting 0-4 at the moment is Benny Q. But we haven't really seen that transition in too much in the late game. This character's still level 18, still keeping pace with Erupt Crimson at the moment. He's a level up. Yeah, he, he's in fact ahead despite all that uh, death. And I, to be honest, I think that's just SPL macro farm being better. I mean, the SEC kids, they know how to fight, as you can see, but they're missing some waves here and there. Crimson is going to have to beat real early. He's real dead. There's the Aegis coming through, but he's stuck in a whirlpool of ice and death. One to fall down already. Kimmy should follow him down into the ground. Rubikami's going to get credit for that one. And now looking to find their way back out. Not many tools are left available for the Eldritch Hounds, but charging in is Aquarius. Looking for Dude Man Bro, who just cannot fight into the Bologna. Benny Q, flickering forward, finds one. There's going to be the second for the mid laner. Benny Q answers back. Yeah, massive answer back from the Valks. Oath is trying to confirm a purple if it will get double stunned here. Has to try and run through the Valks to get away in the jet stream. <laughs> no Beautifully shot. body blocked by Gamma. It wasn't body blocked yet, but but because he was standing there, there was no way he could throw it. Beautiful answer back. Remakami doesn't even want to go to the Gold Fury right now. Going over to the right side of the map. So Primal Fury will go the way of the Valks. And look at the spike of gold. About to be over 4,000 in favor of the Valhalla Valks, who again are down a kill right now. It's still only 7-8, and that just goes to show how much they're able to play the map despite falling down every once in a while. Sure, there's going to be some gang. Sure, they're going to fall, see some kills go the way of the, the Hounds, but what are you getting with that? You touched on it already. Put Benny Q behind. He still hits level 20 before anyone. And here in lies the rub, ladies and gentlemen. We've been seeing these SCC teams in a vacuum all week without really seeing the power that the SPL teams it can bring into these engagements. The Valhalla Valkyries playing very uh, cleanly now since they've been able to break through that initial 14-minute kind of ooze. Yeah, I, I don't think they were worried. I think they knew. No, for sure. Looking at the goalie, they're like, hey, and the kills might look spooky to the untrained eye, but we know we have items, we have late game, we've got a... Artemis, who already finished Ort 8. Arrow, Death's Embrace for Aquarius. They have so much DPS, so much sustain, and Benny Q gets ultimate alternate timeline. He said, I'm not going for five deaths, I'm sticking at four. Pyromancer falls down, and now the Valhalla Valkyries are looking to push up into this jungle. Blinking forward is Krim, and he's gonna find, sorry, he's gonna find Crimson. He does use that dash that turn. He could be in some trouble. He's gonna find the kill, but Benny Q on the return. Oath once again isolated out, and the bludgeon isn't gonna be on the mark. The blink away is gonna find him safe, but Quig can't say the same thing. Wowie takes credit for that kill, and now looking to fish out Dude Man Bro, and just the sheer amount of damage coming out from this roster. It looks like Oath might try to hide around the back here. Doesn't have the HP to even possibly go for a steal. If Typhoon was available, maybe I could see it. It looks like the Valhalla Valk still have that Draconic Transformation, still have Coerce, and they're gonna burn through this FG. You do lose it on Kirmi, but I think you're pretty happy to, number one, answer back with the kill lead, and this gold lead is still climbing the Valks. I've been team fighting so well. Crimson stepped up way too far with no beads. Didn't really recognize how close the Valks were. Kirmi trades his life for that kill, but the answer back, I think you're pretty okay with killing three there. So, I mean, I think it was a total of four, actually. So, they're able to answer back a lot. And now the Valks are able to push down. They have a lot of towers to go through here. So, we're going to see this gold lead climb from what it is to well over 10,000 unless the other towns form some form of defense. And how will they even go about doing that, Trelly? This is not necessarily the best defensive squad. I still think Typhoon in the final judgment could one shot three out of five of the Valhalla Valkyries if they're able to do it right. It's just hard for Krim to charge this final judgment to the, the full extent of the damage. The longer you charge it up, obviously, the more ticks of damage it will get. And then it gets to that one shot potential at the full charge, but you can CC it. There's so much CC from the Valks. Aquarius is constantly diving the back line. If Tusky goes through, you can pretty much kiss that charge goodbye. So it's going to be difficult, but certainly not impossible. I think the Hounds have been able to stay pretty much in this game, given the fact that 
they were down for quite some time. Again, they had the kills, but their gold was pretty much always down. Pushing down the left tier two now, Valhalla Valkyries off to a tear. Every this single alive member of Eldritch Hounds are going to back from the map, but there is no way they're here in town, in time. Sorry, the Typhoon comes through, is going to knock up Gamma, and here's going to be the walls. Rome Ramakami, the Phantom Shell, is going to come through to make sure that they're not too afraid of it. Crimson charges and shoots off that ability, but it's not going to hit anyone. The Aegis from Wowie is going to be good, but what isn't good is Oat's health bar. It's going to fall down to zero, and now the Valkyries looking potentially to push into that Titan room, but instead they get wet feet and they're gonna head back out for now. Yeah, definitely the smart call here. Cataclysm is still available and if Dude Van Bro wants a chase with the Yola, I guess that could be an option as well. Probably using it to run away more so than anything. Gonna grab the tier two in mid and they're looking to go for this Phoenix as well. They're up a man, 5v4 here. They're gonna go for this. Absolutely, they want it. They have the manpower, they have the fire giant available to them. They've got a uh, Wowie here, who's going to be doing so much. The Cataclysm comes through to the back. Kill, well, hitting two people, sorry, but Quake is going to be the first target. Ramakami now blinking into the back line, doing some damage, but damage is not going to be enough. Here's a life bar. Will be forfeit for his hubris. Up into the sky goes Dude Van Bro, looking to find something, if anything at all. Up, down, Roma Invicta. Dude Man Bro falls down, and so does the middle Phoenix. Aquarius does not care about the Phoenix. He doesn't care about his team. He is diving your well and making sure that Dude Man Bro will fall. They will back off here. Still the right Phoenix and the right tier two are available, but remember that gold lead I was telling you about? It's about 13,000 now for the Valhalla Valkyries. Pretty close to 14,000. One more camp will do it. So a massive influx. Now about a minute left on the gold. I think they could send this right side trebuchet and look for that tier two tower as well. I think they might just be able to run it down mid, Trelly, my guy. There are still two people on the grayscale for the next 20 minutes. They've got so much time. 20 minutes. And, sorry, two, yeah, 20 whole minutes on the grayscale. How grayscale. do they do that? They're dead for it's, 20 minutes. It's a, it's a 70 minute game. They uh, they died for the 18th time and it's the 20 minute cooldown. I think it would still only be like a minute 30. <laughs> well, you know what? I'm I'm not here for your analysis. I th I'm here for analysis. That's my job. That's why uh, I'm here. All right. Okay. I see. That's yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Either way, I think they will just probably wait for this next fire giant to spawn in here. It's going to peter off in about 25 seconds. Pushing up very far is the hound, though. Trying to find a pick in the jungle, maybe. I don't think they want to step up too far. Really, it's just Gamma that's in range of a pull from Susano and. Oath's like, this isn't the target we want. I don't want the Fafnir. Gamma here on the left-hand side is going to take a fair amount of damage. That just first sweep there alone. Benny Q is frontlining. From, yeah, Benny Q has no fear right now, and he has absolutely no reason to be afraid. Has both of the relics available to him. Has truly an absurd amount of damage. He is carrying the alternate timeline here, Trelly. Yeah, I told you that. You did tell me that. Yeah, and I said he's not going to go for five deaths. He's tied right now for the most deaths in the game. He doesn't want to go yeah. for five. He said, I, I can't He's let feeling the stat go. And looks like they're, they don't care about FG. The FG buff is gone. They want this Phoenix. This is the silliness that Benny Q was thinking about. But Whoa. three people stun up with the Cataclysm into a three-man final judgment. Wowie is going to find his death. But Kimmy turning it back around. Oath falls down here as well. But the damage wasn't good enough. Even in the ideal scenario there, Trelly, Eldritch Hounds only find one. I was going to say, if you can't win a fight after a triple final judgment, triple blink Cataclysm by a quick, I have to give all the credit to Quick there. It's not hard to hit an ultimate when they're standing still for that long. Beautiful play by Quick to set that one up. The Phoenix will survive. That's going to be a massive flux here, but something to note, you also do have to worry about Fire Giant is spawning in. The Elder Towns have to push out two different waves. You could just send Dude Man Bro and then have him ult over. The ult's not available right now, so I think the Valhalla Valkyries are more so on stall duty. We'll be able to pull this EFG in a minute, but Let's just wait until Wowie spawns in. It's better to have our ADC here. No, absolutely. And on top of that, it allows them to wait for that minute for the enhanced Fire Giant to be the precedent. But Aquarius steps up a little bit there, is going to take some damage, forced to use the beads already, is able to turn back around and hit Ramakami for a decent amount. Now, potentially getting rooted out there. The dash is going to find him safe from Dude Man Bro's root. So Ramakami, sorry, Aquarius should be just fine. Yeah, it'll just spawn in here, so we'll be able to save the left Phoenix. But now, look where Wowie is. On Almost here, and it looks like Kirby's running down mid. Might try to fight Oath for that left side. Phoenix charging up the Sonic Boom. We're seeing a brawl over here as well. Gamma getting a little weak here. Quig as well falls down to half HP, forced to use the uh, the Cataclysm there just to immune out the Eclipse pull from his contemporary. But Kimmy in the mid lane 
potentially looking for some sort of split, but he's going to split and he's going to be able to come up through the top here. Trelli, this could be a masterful flank. Remakami really up at the front here, blinking forward. Kimmy looking to find Dude Man Bro. He is able to find the dash. No mana available for the ADC, and he's going to be the first to fall. Remakami is going to be the second for a double kill for Kimmy, and they're still looking to go. Oath still trying to pick up the speed buff, and Kimmy rockets straight into the mid lane. Yeah, there's going to be a 3v5 here. Enhanced Fire Giant goes down. That left Phoenix is as good as dead. You still have your right and mid bird though, and that mid one is going to follow suit as well. The Valhalla Valkyries, they don't want the birds anymore. They're looking for the end here, and it's going to be a 3v5. Surgical so far from the boys in blue. Oath trying to run away, but he's not going to escape. I spoke too soon. The Blink is going to find him safe for now, but there's only so much that this team has to play with at the moment. Typhoon comes through, but isn't going to connect with anyone. Tusky is dropped on the ground, and Trelly Rally, the first game of the day, favors the Valkyries. Yeah, beautiful play by Benny Q specifically able to answer back. Falls four times in that game in the early and then still beats everyone to level 20. That's just perseverance and finding good farm. He's just a smart player. Even though he got pretty focused down, he was able to keep his team on track and hear me as well. Finding those early ganks, able to keep the team in the game. Again, if you're looking to be down that much, but you're still ahead in gold, you're playing the map so well. No, absolutely. Kimi and the rest of the Valhalla Valkyries truly showing us what these SPL teams being here is going to mean for the SCC players. We still got one more team to see. That's gonna be the Scarabs, who did finish a place above the Valkyries. So we'll have to see how they will pan out here coming into game number two. But let's not forget about this first game just yet. The, the desk will break it down. Thank you so much, Blazy and Trelly. An explosive game out here by the Valhalla Valkyries. They find their win over their former SCC rivals, and they'll be able to move themselves on in the tournament, move themselves on into the brackets, put themselves only one set away from qualifying to the next day of play. It's J-Mac and Rowe here to break down that game between these two teams. And it's a lot of what we were discussing earlier on with the composition and the style of play the Valkyries wanted, this yeah. objective-focused play. In those first 15 minutes, we saw a lot of fighting, a lot of kills, but never a lead established. It really did feel like that 15-minute mark was when the Valkyries had finally turned on the Jets and got this game going. Yeah, look, in the early game, even pre-15, there was a period where Hounds were actually in the lead as well. And we're talking about Valhalla Valkyries having the stronger early game comp. So they did a great job finding those ganks. I think they got Benny Q down to 0-4 at some point. But once again, it gets to that 15-minute mark and their objective DPS really comes into play. We have Merlin here. Look at the... I mean, we're talking objective DPS. What about DPS on gods as well? When they come through a funnel like that and he's able to throw his abilities down, look at Aqua and in front of him as well is going to continue to make that space and he's able to blink in at the end of this team fight and do a huge amount of damage to three targets right there you know just imagine on th this damage on objectives as well they go straight back to the gold fury pyromancer all that able to burn it down and build a gold lead so they can push phoenixes just like this and i had to point out going into that little highlight clip benny was zero and four the the lightning rotted for his team when it came down to these fights so much aggression thrown towards benny q but Benny's used to it at this point, but from his times in the SEC, his times here in the SPL as well, he, he has been a consistent, fa a consistent factor for teams to make sure to try and shut down. And even despite the fact that he was losing in every single one of those team fights, losing his life, he was never falling behind in experience. Yeah, look, and he's staying on Fire Giant in times like this as well. While Kiyomi's not even there to help DPS, Aqua's out there zoning, but it's just, you know, the Hunter and the Maid sitting on that Fire Giant with the support while their carries, or not their carries, their jungler and their soul lane are up there frontlining, creating space for them. Ends up with, you know, a, a great KDA on Kiyomi and a, uh, you know, decent KD on, on, on Wowie as well. 4-1 and 9 for Wowie, 7-4 and 2 on Kirmi. And I think for me, the dual lane of the Valkyries is so far this season, you know, in phase one of the SPL, that's where a lot of the struggle of the Valkyries have been. Benny and Kirmi have been able to consistently put themselves towards the top of the charts. Aqua, a very consistent solo laner. So seeing Gamma and Wowie being able to step up in an event like this, even in their first game of play after having a couple of weeks off from competitive play leading up to this tournament, I think that to me is a nice little ray of hope for this team. Yeah, look, and it's, they've just, you know, now actually all moved here as well. So there's still new to being all in the studio together. It's kind of just up, they're just ready to springboard off of that first first phase that didn't go great for them. They did find a win over the, the Leviathans towards the end of the season. But, you know, coming into a tournament where all of that is wiped away, it's just seeding. Now they have a chance to really prove themselves. They're all here. They're starting with the SEC team, so they have, I guess, time to warm up and then, you know, go further into the bigger leagues. So now we've gotten our first kind of look at the, the new pacing that may be established for the remainder of our day as far as our SPL versus SCC matchups are concerned. Valkyries do find the victory over the Hounds. It means they are now one set away from qualification. 
And next we have the Kalen Wardens and the Solar Scarabs. Winner of that will face the Valkyries. Loser faces the Eldritch Hounds. And the Solar Scarabs are a team that are known in the SPL for their early game aggression. Those first 10 to 15 minutes are where the Solar Scarabs have always been shining this phase. Now it's going to be a matter of can they transition that first 15 minute dominance into the 25, 30 minute victories. Yeah, and they said either yes or no when I spoke to them outside there. So they said they're playing three games today, no matter what, whether there is three <laughs> wins or three losses, they're out of here early. I'm okay with that. We can end up with, with some really exciting early games today. Yeah, I'm very curious as to how the uh, the Scarabs drafting is going to be, you know, what kind of compositions that we see from these guys, because they're always one to bring uh, a, a unique level of spice. You know, you get yeah. teams like the Dragons, you get Pagan who comes out with these really weird picks out there. The Scarabs are also known for doing a little bit of strange things. We'll see what they can bring to us in our next set right after.